Hello, everybody. I will be talking about a new computing paradigm I call MEM computing. Uh, MEM stands for time and locality memory or time and locality. And I will be discussing about uh, its fundamentals and applications. Uh, this is the same type of the title of a book that I've been writing for Oxford University Press, which will come out hopefully by the end of this year or early next year. The work is funded by uh, DOE, DARPA, NSF, and the Center for Magnetic Memory Recording Research at UCSD. And I have also a company that has released, uh, with the same name, it has released the software as a service. So if you want to test um, the results, some of the results I will show you later, you can actually um, use the SAS uh, free of evaluation for evaluation. And let's, let's start by saying which problems uh, I want to uh, tackle with this type of paradigm. Main computing can be designed for um, analog, analog purposes uh, or digital or both. So I will discuss only the digital version of this paradigm to solve tough real life combinatorial optimization problems, which are um, problems that appear in essentially any type of um, aspect of science and technology, for example, finding the ground state in a non convex energy landscape or the flight scheduling and routing. Uh, cheap or uh, software design, uh, electric power distribution, autonomous vehicles response to environment, and many more. So these are tough in the sense that if you increase the size of the problem, they typically, the compute time typically uh, explodes exponentially. Of course, for the difficult problems, because you can find easy ones also in this class, but we're not interested in those, we're interested only in the difficult ones. And uh, um, these problems can be written in Boolean format um, as a collection of clauses, that, uh, which are constraints that relate to different variables and their negations. They're called um, uh, literals, um, variables and their negations. Let's say uh, I have two variables, x1 and y1, related by logical or, and these clauses are related to each other by other logical gates, let's say logical end. In fact, any type of uh, uh, problem um, in the class that I discussed before, it can be written this way. You can uh, uh, show that these, these uh, uh, Boolean formulas can be written as Boolean circuits. And if you re uh, look at this as a physical um, circuit, you realize immediately uh, two things. One is, is that the different literals are, um, appear in different clauses. So, so in some sense, uh, you need a machine that has some long range or long wavelength information to solve these problems efficiently. That's the first thing. The other thing is that if I know the solution to the problem, then I can easily check it, at least for um, decision problems, of course, optimization, you cannot check it so easily. But for decision problem, you can check it. What you want is the reverse. So you want to set, let's say, all true values, all one at the bottom and the output of these gates and that let the system find its own uh, solution. So you want to solve uh, the problem in reverse. So you want to uh, 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 have a machine that is uh, that has both long range order, long wavelength information, or at least it develops uh, long range order during dynamics and is able to solve these problems in reverse. If you use the standard gates, you cannot do that, right? So you, what we do, we take the traditional combinatorial optimization problems we write them in Boolean circuits, which are not even unique. For a given problem, you can find different uh, realizations, uh, representations of that problem. And some of them may be um, more conducive to numerics uh, than others. And we replace those gates with special gates, which we build uh, using terminal locality. So what are those gates? Take, for example, an end gate with a truth table uh, represented here. And these gates are unidirectional, so they cannot do anything other than just taking the input and giving out the output. That's it. So they're um, um, unidirectional logically. So you, you can do nothing more than that. But if you have a um, time and locality, you can design uh, objects we, we call self-organizing logic gates, such that um, these dynamical systems will always uh, go towards one of the, in this case, four possible, possible logically consistent um, uh, propositions if you have an end gate. For example, if I, um, I can design a system, a dynamical system with memory, time and locality, that, that, um, that if I take a, a signal, let's say one from below, it will um, go only to this logically consistent state, one, one at the top. 
And if you if you come in with a zero at the bottom, I can design it so that it will always uh, go into three possible attractors, uh, zero, 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 one, and one, zero. So in other words, I can design dynamical systems with memory that will always go to, in this case, four possible attractors, which are the four logically consistent solution, the solutions of this particular gate. And I can do that for any type of gate. Uh, I will consider only ele electrical circuit realizations of these things. Um, so these would be uh, voltages, currents, and so forth. Uh, but you can actually realize this in many other ways. And once you put them uh, uh, together into um, a circuit, uh, they, these gates, uh, if you apply a certain input, the, the, the gates will try to satisfy each other um, first locally because that's the connectivity is local, but then they develop, as I will show you later, a uh, long range order, and they will try to solve the problem collectively. And then you read the solution at the appropriate terminals. So to go deeper into the realization of these gates, uh, here is an example with, um, let's say this is an end gate and this is one zero one. You can uh, represent the one with, let's say, a plus one volt and the zero with minus one, vo one volt, but you can choose whatever. And inside these gates, we have a dynamical correction modules, which are uh, active uh, elements that read uh, the opposite values of the terminals uh, voltages and uh, uh, they realize that in this case uh, this uh, uh, module is connected to this terminal realizes that this is not the correct uh, configuration that satisfies this truth table and it will inject current so that the zero will go into one the bottom one will do the same with the other two terminals it realizes that it's not in a uh, consistent configuration it takes current out of it so that it transforms the one into zero so it satisfies another a logically consistent proposition. So which one will be satisfied that since this goes on continuously um, and, uh, and all of them will try to satisfy independently, um, which one will win? Well, it depends on the uh, initial conditions and the environment or the type of problem you're trying to solve. You can realize this with uh, um, standard resistive memories for the passive part of this circuit, but you also need active elements. Remember, it's very important that you have active elements because you need feedback. You need uh, uh, these devices to uh, collect feedback. That's where memory comes in. You need uh, you know, the memory of what happened in the past to um, collect information on, how, on what to do um, next, right? So you need active elements to um, for, um, push these gates uh, towards the logically consistent solutions. Resistive memories can be made with CMOS, the active um, elements also, and so you can realize uh, everything using CMOS, using standard transistors. And these gates can be built uh, uh, for OR, XOR, any type of logic gate, and they work uh, um, bi-directional. So not in a, in a bijective term uh, way, but uh, there are uh, bidirectional from a logical point of view. You can also um, build them using uh, nanomagnets. For example, here is a one possible realization. If you use uh, four um, nanomagnets, let's say cylindrical nanomagnets, and you fix the uh, bias uh, um, magnetization on one of them, and you have uh, two that represent the traditional input and one that represents the traditional output, these are coupled uh, uh, by stray field and you can, in fact, realize these nanomagnets so that at equilibrium, all four possible um, logically consistent states, in this case for an end, um, are, uh, are equally probable. This is what th this plot shows. And uh, for those uh, times, a few times uh, that actually you do uh, don't um, have a logically consistent um, proposition, you can also again use a dynamic um, correction module, here we call it dynamic error suppression, that eliminates uh, um, logically inconsistent states. You don't need that all the time, um, only those few times where this is, uh, uh, th this is not in a consistent state. So you can realize this using nanomagnets, the advantage of this is of course lower energy consumption and possibly um, smaller um, a special uh, footprint. So you can realize that, uh, these self-organizing gates using uh, CMOS or uh, nanomagnets and possibly even other types of uh, physical devices. 
once you put them together, then you can solve uh, um, combinatorial optimization problems of the type that I discussed at the beginning. Here is the incredible thing that these are non-quantum dynamical systems. So unlike quantum computing that needs to be built in hardware to see any advantage, in this case, uh, the dynamical equations of motion of these systems are standard ordinary differential equations. In this case, for factorization is uh, um, the voltages at the, uh, that is the same for any other type of problem, voltages at the uh, terminals, uh, the matrices that define the topology of the circuit uh, and the memory variables and so forth. And these are uh, simply nonlinear ordering differential equations describing dynamical systems with memory. And the variables here are the current voltages and internal state. So you, you can literally take the uh, standard devices, um, put them together to represent those self-organizing gates, put them together again to form the uh, circuits that represent those problems, and simulate uh, their equations. Or even you can uh, simplify those equations by maintaining the same physics and the same idea, ideas that I showed you before, simplifying the equations for the benefit of numerical simulations. That's what we've done, for example, in our group, and that's what the company is doing. So we simplify the equations uh, um, of this physical system, so maintaining the, the same structure and idea of the actual physical systems, but uh, they're simplified equations so we can even speed up the numerics. The advantage of all this is that you can test these, uh, these results in, uh, in software um, and see whether the, the machine works. Because if it works in software, it has to work also in hardware because numerical errors are um, much, um, much more uh, dominant um, than um, experimental or physical uh, noise, right? Because uh, numerical errors accumulate in time, so there are no local in time. The physical noise is typically local in both space and time. So the problem, uh, you start from a problem uh, uh, that has a discrete set of states, and then you transform this discrete set, as a set of states into continuous variables, for example, voltages, if you use an electrical realization of the, <clears throat> of the system. Then you enlarge this phase space by adding memory variables, and these eliminate any local minima in the system by leaving only the settled points and the equilibrium points, uh, which are solutions uh, to the problem you're trying to solve. It is in this enlarged uh, phase space of voltage memory uh, variables that you try to solve this problem, these problems. And uh, uh, you start from an initial condition, and then the system tries to go through the, this phase space. I'll show you uh, through a particular trajectory until it finds the solution. So this is the, the, the physics behind the, the operation of these machines. And uh, um, you can have uh, different attractors apart from the, the equilibrium points that define the problems, the um, the solutions of the, of the problems, which are the logically consistent states, you may also have a periodic orbits. And if you have such a, such a thing, then you don't solve the problem, or you can have even chaos. And again, you may have issues if you have chaotic behavior. For the um, chaos, it's easy to actually show that uh, these dynamical systems don't have a chaos. So they're topologically constrained so that they, they cannot have chaos. Uh, for periodic orbits, we had to prove a case by case. So for the ca cases we, we um, discuss, uh, in, uh, we publish in the literature, we proved uh, uh, that they don't have periodic orbits. The dynamical systems we, we came up with don't have periodic orbits and they don't have chaos. Um, the other thing that we showed uh, using a, a technique borrowed from quantum field theory, supersymmetric topological field theory, is that the dynamics uh, in this humongous phase space, which grows linearly with a number of degrees of freedom, but is still a large, uh, gigantic phase space, uh, doesn't wander arbitrarily in the phase space, but it goes through uh, what we call instantonic trajectories, specific uh, classical trajectories that connect critical points. So points for which the flow vector field is zero in these dynamical equations of motion of the system. And so the system starts from an arbitrary initial condition, a falls close to um, into the, the first critical point closest to it, and then jumps, uh, literally tunnels uh, in Euclidean space to the next uh, um, uh, critical point. It could be anywhere in the, in the phase space and uh, uh, to the next, to the next until it finds a solution. The interesting thing is that these are dissipative systems. So the instantons can only connect critical points 
the uh, lower uh, the number of unstable directions. For example, this one has uh, two unstable directions, and this has this critical point has one unstable direction. The instanton can connect them. The, the instantons cannot connect uh, in the sequence system. Cannot connect uh, uh, critical points that have the same um, a number of unstable directions. And the other thing is that uh, uh, since it's the CPC system, uh, the anti-instanton solution so that, that connects uh, this critical point backward in time, time reverse solutions, are exponentially suppressed, so they're gapped. So the low energy dynamics of the system uh, goes through a succession of instantons, like the flow of a ball in a pinball machine, which I represent below. So that's what, what they do, they literally go through uh, critical points uh, and uh, until they find uh, the solution. And uh, uh, you can actually count the number of instantaneous steps to reach the solution, because as I said, that in the sympathy systems, instantons connect to your points that have less and less uh, unstable directions. And so you go from a critical point that has a, a certain amount of unstable direction to another one that has a, at least one less unstable direction and, and, and so forth until you find the solution, if a solution exists. And since uh, uh, the number of unstable, unstable directions uh, uh, can be at most equal to the dimension of the phase space, and the dimension of phase space grows uh, polynomially with the number of variables or degrees of freedom in the system, then you can show that the number of instantaneous uh, jumps between quotes tunneling events can only grow polynomially with the number of degrees of freedom. Now, this uh, does not prove NP equal to P because these are non Turing machines. They operate in continuous time, although they map integers into integers, they, they operate in continuous time. It only means that uh, there are physical systems uh, that can be designed so that they can solve uh, uh, problems that are classified that are difficult in, um, within the Turing paradigm um, in polynomial time within this paradigm, which is different than the Turing paradigm. These machines are Turing complete, but they're not necessarily Turing equivalent. We haven't proved that yet. Okay, so uh, let me show you an example. Here is factorization of a number, 1073, which is 11 bits. And these are simulated. The dots uh, represent the uh, zeros and ones at the, at the in, uh, input and output. So there is no difference anymore between input and output. And uh, uh, the circles are the zeros and ones that represent this number. Again, represented with plus one volt at the logical one and minus one volt at logical zero, but you can choose any type of uh, voltage threshold. And then we switch on these uh, uh, input um, voltages that represent this number, and we let the system self-organize into the solution until it finds uh, um, the, the solution of the factorization of this number. Now, if you notice, uh, uh, there are sort of waves that go uh, um, back and forth um, in, in the circuit. In fact, that these waves are uh, instantons or in one higher dimensions are solitons that take um, the system from one uh, local uh, critical point to another local critical point from one vacuum to another vacuum similar to an in, uh, a solid on the uh, this flips, let's say, all spins up in a ferromagnet to the other vacuum, all spins spins down in a ferromagnet, eliminating uh, along the way uh, logical defects because the system starts with a, a lot of uh, gates that are not satisfied, so there are defects, logical defects, and you have these uh, instantons or solitons in one higher dimension that get rid of those defects until the solution is found. Now you can compare, if, the, if you build these things in hardware, then you can compare with the quantum computing. If n is the number of bits, you know in quantum computing you have the Schroes algorithm, which is a probabilistic alg algorithm, which means you have to um, do the measurement many, many times. Uh, for example, when, when they um, did the factorization of 15, the number 15, five times three, uh, that was given with about 50% of probability. And if you have a quantum computer without the coherence, so it can be scaled, then um, uh, you need uh, uh, an order n square, where n is the, again, number of bits, log to n, log to n square um, operations on a quantum computer. And uh, uh, we tend to forget, but you always need uh, with a quantum computer also a classical uh, post-processing. And the classical post-processing uh, um, has a, and a scalability of order polynomial uh, n. So the a quantum computer is both probabilistic 
and it requires always a post-processing that is classical. So in some sense, the post-processing um, is the major limitation, if you wish, uh, of, the, of the quantum computer. If you use the circuit I showed you before and you build any hardware, then our machines are deterministic. Uh, they would solve the problem without need of uh, rerunning it uh, many times. And uh, in th this particular um, uh, realization of factorization would scale uh, as n squared, and that's it. So there is nothing else. And it's better than the quantum algorithm, uh, Scholl's algorithm, um, even if you don't consider the classical counterpart. Now, this is, of course, in hardware. In software, uh, there is no way for us to uh, simulate a quantum computer. We can, and I will show you, uh, simulations of um, and computing machines. And of course, you don't, in software, you have to contend with numerical errors, so you don't have this ideal, uh, um, uh, let's say, quadratic scalability in this case. Now, if, uh, if I look at another problem, which is NP-complete, it's a three set where you have uh, um, or gates uh, with only three literals uh, related to each other, then again, uh, you have to find those instances that are difficult. We, we found hard satisfiable instances, instances that are used also in uh, SAT competitions, and we use those. Um, how do we know that they are uh, difficult? Because we tested them on uh, state-of-the-art algorithms like WOCSAT, which is a local uh, search algorithm, and SID, um, which is a message passing algorithm using probability distributions to um, accelerate the, the process. And in this case, you see here log um, linear uh, space um, that in these insets, these algorithms explode exponentially for this type of, uh, for this type of uh, um, uh, problems. So we know that these, these are difficult instances, at least for this type of algorithms. In the main uh, um, panel, you see the simulations done using MATLAB on a single core. And uh, according to the ratio between number of variables versus number of uh, clauses, uh, um, then you can go from uh, um, a scalability of the square root of n to n cubed for the most difficult uh, cases at this ratio. And if you extrapolate, so these are for 100 instances per size, and we're plotting here the median uh, for all of the, of the cases, for each one of those cases, one instance, uh, the most difficult cases would take about 15 hours on a single core. But if you extrapolate uh, these two, uh, it would take over the age of the universe to do the same uh, calculation, same, find the same solution. So it's a substantial advantage. You can find the result uh, here. We also looked at the ground state of the spin glass, which is an optimization problem where you have uh, spins coupled uh, with random uh, um, um, couplings. And again, we found, we looked for uh, difficult instances that are called frustrated loop instances where you have the lattice, uh, which is uh, essentially saturated with uh, loops of a certain length, so non-local objects. And these are used in um, uh, to benchmark quantum computers, quantum annealers. And the advantage is that you can write the Hamiltonian as the sum of the Hamiltonians of the single uh, loops, frustrated loops. They are difficult to find. Uh, the, the ground state is difficult to find because um, these are non-local objects. Uh, there are loops that are frustrating in the sense that there is one spin which is frustrated with respect to the thermomagnetic um, spin direction for all the other spins. And uh, uh, so here you see uh, again uh, all um, all the, you know, the software and the um, solvers we tested uh, like simulating annealing, parallel tampering. We also use CPLEX, which is a commercial solver. They all explode exponentially, and uh, uh, the mem computing uh, solver, uh, which is called here Falcon, uh, is actually subquadratic. And we could actually push it to uh, a large number of, uh, of spins. So you see always a, a large advantage compared to traditional approaches. And this is not uh, you know, one or two instances, but we have um, done a lot of uh, um, benchmarks so looking at uh, um, uh, other optimization problems random to max sat, max cat, and so forth. And this was done by the supercomputer center, not by us. But you can find uh, the results here, and we always find an, an advantage compared even state-of-the-art uh, uh, solvers used in competitions. We extended this to integer linear programming, and we solved in, uh, in less than a minute two unsolved problems that were unsolved for um, a decade or so. And this was certified by the computer scientists at this library where these problems are maintained. 
you can find this on this paper. Um, in fact, if you go on their website, you find the first visible solution found by man computing. Uh, we use this to accelerate deep learning. I won't show this. We always find um, an advantage. In fact, we can do unsupervised learning better than state-of-the-art supervised learning methods. I showed you the grand state of the eyes and spin glass and various problems that the company has been solving with other companies. Uh, here is um, one, one that is already um, online on archive. There is the solution of the fifth Airbus loading problem, which was put out by Airbus um uh, for quantum computers if they're built in in hardware but uh, uh, it was solved by the company in linear time to scale in fact it can be deployed already in the, in the industry and it's a problem in integer linear program so we have hundreds of thousands of instances now um, of tough problems that we can uh, where we see a huge advantage of the I want to conclude by showing a little bit more of physics and, uh, and why this thing is so robust. And these machines are so robust against noise, in this case, numerical noise. But if they're robust against numerical noise, they have to be robust also against physical noise. And I told you that the, the machine goes through in phase space uh, through these instantons, which are tunneling events in Euclidean space until it finds uh, the solution. Now, uh, the, if you look at uh, the an instanton, so here voltages versus time, and the instantons appear as spikes, which are not delta function. They're actually um, uh, spikes with a width of an RC time. R is the resistance, so C is the capacitance. And if you focus on one of these uh, uh, instantonic jumps, uh, these spikes in uh, voltages, and you look at the correlations of the voltages in the circuit, they're actually flat until you hit the boundaries which means that the, uh, the machine at the beginning um, tries to satisfy the, the logical gates locally, it's, it realizes it's frustrated uh, and it develops a, a long range order. So the uh, logic gate in this, at this point can correlate with the logic gate anywhere in the system. So you have literally a rigid system like a superfluid um, and, this, and the machine is able to correlate uh, um, flipping of these voltages or spins or whatever variables you're looking at um, anywhere in the in the system. So this is an incredible advantage. The other advantage is that if you uh, look um, using topological field theory, if you look at the matrix elements on these instantons, which are essentially the uh, amplitudes of tunneling between critical points, these are topological invariants. You can prove this analytically. Uh, topological invariant means that uh, to destroy it, you have to change the topology of phase space, which is um, really not an easy thing. So you have to introduce so much noise, so much numerical errors or so much physical noise that you destroy the topology of phase space to change uh, uh, the amplitude. So that's why you have, uh, we can solve these things for a long time, uh, um, sometimes even 15 hours or a day using Ford Euler, which is the simplest method possible. In fact, uh, it's interesting because we tested the three different uh, uh, explicit methods, Euler, Trapezoid, and Rangikata fourth order, and uh, we looked at uh, uh, the number of uh, solutions as a function of delta t. We fixed uh, the delta t of the numeric, numeric integration schemes, and as you expect, of course, uh, increasing delta t, then you go from solving all the instances to uh, not solving the, uh, at all, right? Now, notice first that the delta T here is pretty large, substantially large of the order of one half or one. And the, uh, the other thing is that as soon as you uh, um, put a uh, increased delta T, it's like having um, or like putting a lot of the sinks, a lot of the um, defects in the phase space where you get stuck. So for example, at very low delta T, you have lots of paths, lots of instantons to go from one critical point to another. But then increasing delta T, you go like in a percolation transition, directed percolation transition into an absorbing state where you don't have any solution. The interesting thing is that uh, you would expect that, that the critical delta T at which this uh, solvable and solvable transition occurs uh, uh, would decay with uh, uh, exponentially. So you would uh, need uh, an, an exponential decay in delta T to uh, with increase in size, right? Uh, um, in reality, it, it, you don't need that. In fact, uh, you um, empirically we find that you need a, a, a power law decay of delta t. In fact, in the, all the simulations I showed you before, the delta t, the minimal delta t was fixed. 
So the delta t does not need to decay exponentially even in, in numerics. And this is again, uh, can be attributed to the topological robustness of these machines. So in this case, we didn't, uh, we didn't, we don't have an analytical proof of this. Uh, um, this is empirical, but uh, we know for sure using topological field theory that these are topologically robust. So this comes from the same origin. So in conclusion, I showed you uh, a new class of machines we call man computing machines uh, um, that are um, universal because they have a um, universal computational uh, ability. They are too incomplete. Um, we designed them to compute a, a, um, complex problems uh, efficiently. Uh, you can design them for analog or digital um, uh, problems. Uh, I showed you those that uh, are designed for digital in this talk. And the interesting thing is that you can make them in hardware using either um, standard CMOS or nanomagnets, as I showed you before. Uh, but unlike quantum computers, you can simulate the differential equations of these uh, dynamical systems. So you can, in fact, uh, design those equations to simplify. You can simplify them uh, so that they, uh, they're easier to solve numerically. And you don't need to always uh, stick with the original physical equations, so long as the physics uh, uh, remains. And this is an interesting um, paradigm because it, com it connects again computing with topology other than topological quantum compu uh, computation. And the topology comes from uh, uh, topological obje objects, uh, topological excitations we in, in field theory call instantons, which are simply uh, classical trajectories that connect in equivalent vacua or the critical points in phase space. It's also interesting because uh, the, the calculation of, of number of instantons to reach the solution is an exercise in algebraic topology. And I used it to do, um, uh, to say something about complexity theory, right? Computation and complexity. So is there a duality between computation and complexity and algebraic topology? This would be interesting because it would be interesting uh, uh, towards the, the famous question if NP is equal to P or not. And here duality means that I'm using tools uh, of a field, algebraic topology in this case, to um, solve or uh, give some answers uh, uh, to difficult problems in another field. Duality has been used in many areas in physics and mathematics. So maybe there is such a, a duality also in this type of, uh, um, in, in between computational complexity and algebraic topology. So I didn't talk about uh, how to use it in machine learning. You can find our publications. Uh, um, briefly, I mentioned optimization. We are working on quantum Hamiltonians. We also see there uh, some advantages. Um, if you want to do um, real-time computing, then uh, you need hardware. So if you want to deploy this uh, in, uh, let's say, in, um, in cars or robots and so forth, then you need uh, the hardware realization because as much as the software is fast, it is never as fast as the real-time computing, right? The, the devices will solve the problem, you know, could solve the problem in a very uh, short time. So these are the uh, uh, students that worked uh, um, late, lately on this on this paradigm. Sean, Haik, uh, Rudy, and Yuan Han. These are the funding agencies, the company as well. If you're interested in the SAS, um, you can look up uh, uh, my papers or um, be on the lookout for this book from Oxford University Press. And I thank you very much.